Welcome to church. Welcome to everyone inside. Um, <clears throat> I hope I still have a bit of a voice that it doesn't start growling a bit later. That is just because of the intensity of our praise and worship previously. So welcome to those also online this morning. Welcome down to Courtney down in the Cape and uh, those folks in Lesotho and those people in, Les in Switzerland and um, Tina up in Chad and uh, we're thinking of everyone this morning and praying for you. And praying for those that can't be here with us this morning. Um, we are believing and trusting that um, even this morning, the, this word will be a grace that is released for people. I really believe that there's, there's, there's a few Sundays ago we spoke about this, just this new season. But there's something new being released. And you know, um, and that the enemy would want to steal your and my breakthrough. So... Um, some of those who aren't here this morning, some of those who are busy going through things, people are listening online that are really been taking hold of and trusting God for certain things. I really believe God wants to give us a breakthrough. You know, it's like that, uh, the, the paralyzed guy at the pool of Bethesda, that every time, you know, stirring of the water, someone else would jump in and be healed. And there is really, a, I believe, a now season for things. You know, if the sons of Issachar knew the times and the seasons. And they could discern this is what God's doing. This is what when we need to do this and that. So the sons of Issachar understood the times and the seasons. And many times in the church we don't know when to move with God when he's moving. So sometimes we will have a program because it worked last year or last week. But what is the spirit of God doing? So it's so important to be a, a church or a ministry that we move with what God is doing. So um, uh, we, we had also a big announcement this morning which I'm not mentioning online um, but um, um, just what we heard this morning certain breakthroughs that happened so we thankful to God for that he's faithful and uh, things we've been contending for years for so we are thankful for that but I really believe even with the word I shared this morning um, I really I'm going to recap on a few things as well um, so just bear with me because I just want to build into something but I really believe um, God is serious about his church. He wants a church without blemish, without stain. Who, who would, um, okay, I know there's the woke world out there. I'm not speaking to you, but may Jesus find you. But what I am saying, who of those that are ladies in the house here, and uh, even though you might be young, and you would say, you know what, I, 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 want to, I actually want a wedding dress that don't, doesn't have mud on it. That doesn't, it's not torn. I mean, come on. Uh, what husband-to-be would say, yeah, I would love to see my wife in a beautiful wedding dress without blemish, without stain. Because something that has a blemish and stain has been used and abused. So what man would want that? So how about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? And that is why Jesus is serious about what he's doing in the body of Christ. Um, there's been so many moral failures, so many failures throughout, for, for months we've been hearing about this. And, and it's so sad in that, because yet for the grace of God, there I go, there you go. So, um, but I really believe we, we stepped into this time and season where God has given a divine enablement for us to get certain breakthroughs we didn't. And God is really serious about the purity of the church and the bride. All right, because not all that are in church are part of the bride. So God is dealing with the hearts of um, people who are hungry for him, hungry to change. And, um, and if you're serious f uh, to walk with God, he's serious to walk with you. Yeah. And he will finish the work that he started in you. Um, my, one of my brother's favorite scriptures was, God helps those who help themselves. Yet. I'm trusting for your salvation. But what I want to say in that the context of that is that unless you respond to God, you cannot receive what God has for you. Because God does not desire for anyone to perish, but it is a choice we have. That is why God is not in control of what is happening in the world. He is in charge. Because if he was in control, everyone would be saved. But we have a choice. So he is in charge, yes, but we have a choice. And um, this morning, in that this word, I want to just continue sharing. I just want to recap a bit from last week, and I'll just go a bit further on this. And I started to share with you, and I said to you that there were certain statistics that came out in 
um, in America not too long ago that spoke about 23 million Christians had basically turned to atheism or spiritism or just whatever, just walked away from following the Lord. Um, um, actually, someone, one of our family members sent a clip which I posted as well. Um, which spoke about even where a Muslim is announcing this, how, this and figure actually I just gave to you. That saying how they are busy buying up all the churches and schools now for Islam. Because Christians have turned away from the Lord. That's quite scary. So what am I trying to say is that God is serious about his church. He will not be mocked. He, he's serious about his church. It's not uh, we will have the world and the church to mixed and mingle together. No, 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 it can't be. If you're either hot and, and on fire for God, you're not medium and you're not cold. He'll spit us out. And so um, we, we hear these certain stats in that, and, and it came, there was a conclusion that it came to why so many people have been lost, and that is that they were not experiencing the presence of God. So many times churches are about hatch, match, dispatch. My mother taught me that one. So you would have, even in the newspapers, that sometimes there still are, a hatch means someone who's just been born. That's what the priests or the pastors or the reverends were doing. We are, we, we're doing a christening. Not a dedication, christening. And that's hatching. The second one is match, meaning marriage. We're going to do a marriage ceremony. That's what many times churches are seen as from the world. And then the next one is dispatch. We look in the newspapers, who's died? Dispatching. And that is how someone's been buried. And that's what all church is known for. But it is supposed to be a family of God where the presence of God is because we are not. Remember the Bible says this, is that we are the house of God. The spiritual house of God. And if we the spiritual house of God, the presence of God is supposed to be so there. That is why not just the, in, I say, it's so important our individual relationship with the Lord, but the corporate meeting is so important because there's a corporate anointing. It's the house of God being built up. We are not just a floating body out there like some ghost or something there floating in the leg is there, the foot is there, and we call it the church. That's not the church. Every city, every town has a local church where people gather together. Therefore, do not leg neglect the gathering. I mean, why would there be scriptures like that if we were just part of the church but floating somewhere? Come on. Let me not get sidetracked. So, I'm, I'm speaking about the whole thing about Holiness and purity, being set apart. And I spoke to you that the scripture, which is in John 14, 21, that Jesus says, I will love him and manifest myself to him. Jesus said this to you and me, I will love you and I'll manifest. That's one translation. And manifest the word that is fully known by revealing clearly to bring to the light to disclose, to sim and basically simply put the tangible presence of God. And if we're not experiencing this, guys, the Lord promises us in his John 14, 21. If we don't experience the tangible presence of God, then we need, it's not, it's not, the problem is not God's side. We need to go look internally and say, God, what is it that is preventing me from experiencing you? Because to serve and to walk and to know the Lord is an experience. It is not, it is by faith I come to know him. But in the relationship I come closer to him. The glory of the Lord is the actual Hebrew translation speak of this. The glory is to see God face to face. Are you seeing God face to face? Because that's the invitation. And if you don't, then it's like, Lord, I, 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 and this is not condemning or anything. It's like the invitation is put out there, just like the pool or Bethesda was being stirred. But the paralyzed guy couldn't get in. We, we need to know the seasons and the times when God is moving. If we miss it, we have to wait for another season sometimes. I've seen that in the church. I mean, 40 years, the Israelites went around the mountain. They had an opportunity of six weeks to cross over. And they took 40 years. Only two in those under 20 crossover. All right. So 
I, I spoke about this, how uh, it's a literal, physically, uh, uh, that God wants us to experience in Him, to experience Him. And um, what, remember what I said, religion, because, you know, religion is, is a bad taste in the mouth. And also sometimes religion said holiness is you know, some boring thing. Remember, the religious mindset of holiness is what you can do and you can't. It has to do with a lot of rules and regulations. So I come to church, I stand up, sit down, do my little hokey pokey and turn around. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> but you understand, that's what religion does. It gives you a set of things to do, but there's no life in it. And you anyway go home and the world at, at, at home or at school or in business doesn't change. We need to bring heaven into that place. And if we're not experiencing heaven personally, then it's going to be very diff difficult to express it. So this is our invitation. God, I desire more of you. So remember what I said is that holiness, um, this is what God, God says in his word is that if we don't pursue, without being holy, without uh, having clean hands and a pure heart, we cannot ascend the hill of the Lord. We cannot encounter him. All right. Then what I said to you is this, is that there's two types of holiness. Then don't confuse this. I'm just recapping. Two types of holiness. I said to you, the one is a positional holiness. So when you and I give our hearts to Jesus, positionally, we are just as if we have not sinned, justified. We stand before him holy. All right. We are uh, in Ephesians one four, uh, uh, verse 4 says this, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him. He chose us even before the foundation of the world. God doesn't live in time, so it already happened before the world was formed. I don't always understand it, but that's what it says. So He chose us already before the foundation of the world. So... Um, the blood of Jesus, remember, has purchased us, has washed us clean from our sin, and it causes us to be able to stand before him. Hebrews 4, approach the throne of grace with boldness. Okay, so when we feel shame and sin and guilt, we don't have boldness. When you feel uh, shame and sin and whatever, you won't even want to gather together in a group with people. Why? Because you feel you might be exposed. And you know, family covers you. The enemy removes you. Okay, so today, as you receive the Lord, your Savior, God declares you are holy. Okay, so that's positionally you are holy. Then what we said is that um, because you and I are holy, because that's our position, how do you behave? Remember what I said, I used the example of my wife. I said, okay, my wife and Annalise and I have been married now 30 years. And um, she's not going to start giving her number out to the ex-boyfriends or to the guy who asked for a number. No. So her behavior changed. Us as the bride, our behavior changes towards the groom because we are engaged. We're going to be betrothed to him. We don't mess around. We don't give out our numbers. So... There's a holiness in the way we behave. There's a behavioral holiness. Um, and that is the second type of holiness we're speaking about. So it, it, it aligns to our position. Our behavior aligns to our position. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, we touched on that. And I spoke to you about this in 1 Peter 1. 14 to 15 that says this in the amplified it says live as children of obedience to god do not conform yourselves to the evil desires that governed you in your former ignorance when you did not know the requirements of the gospel but as the one who called you is holy you yourselves also be holy in all your conduct and manner of living so the way we conduct ourselves and our, how our living is is important remember your and my internal world is very important all right that's in 1 peter 1 verse 14 to 15 our internal world is important what are you thinking about what are you watching what are you speaking about listen to me guys it is so easy now 
to pick up your phone and there's porn sites, there's stuff you and I should not be looking at. Access is there. So the enemy would bring things before. I mean, yes, everyone knows that. You, you would literally be looking through on the internet at looking for something and suddenly add or something that gets thrown in like this. How much you spend time with that is the question because that's how the enemy works, okay? But the, the good news is this. Now that we're born again, we actually have power to actually choose life. In the past, we couldn't. Because we had the nature of sin. Now we have the nature of God. Yeah. All right? Some uh, uh, theology spoke about this, that we have an Adamic nature. That's not true. Because the New Testament says, our, you and I are a new creation. We don't have an Adamic nature anymore. Yeah. Just remember that. Otherwise, the excuse will always be, oh, but the flesh is weak. No, no, no. The enemy comes to the things that we still accommodate in our lives. Sometimes we're trying to drive out demons instead of driving out the flesh. We blame it's the demon that influenced me. No, 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 it's your flesh. Meaning you chose something which the flesh might have wanted. But the flesh is being crucified. That's what the word says. You need, I need to believe it. Okay. All right. So we spoke about how in Hebrews 12 verse 14 says, Pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Do you hear what I just said here? Yeah. Remember what I said, if 23 million just in America have fallen away from serving the Lord. Why? Because they didn't experience the presence of God. This scripture just says here in Hebrews 12, 14, pursue what? Holiness, because without it, no one will see the Lord. So if we're not experiencing God, because actually our lifestyle and what our friends tell us, the nonsense, the perversion, what we're looking at, what we're listening to. Listen to me. Only you and God knows what goes in in your head when you're walking around in the shops, in the malls, watching TV. Only God and you know. Don't, I promise you, the devil doesn't know your thoughts, but God does. But the devil can plant seeds for you to think about things. So I say the devil doesn't know what you're thinking. But he can see through your posturing, through what you're doing with your eyes, or how you, what you actually gazing upon. All right. So pursue holiness, okay? And pursue means what? To chase after with the intent to apprehend. That's what pursue means. I'm, I'm running because I want to apprehend. That's why one of the things that I said, even in this house, we're trying to nurture through the testimonies of the miracles, healings, uh, the, the testimonies of what God has done with the different revivals, whatever. There's a stirring up of hunger for God. We are pursuing Him. And when you pursue God, guess what? He's going to pursue you. Yeah. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Meaning that if you're poor mean in spirit, meaning you're hungry. It's the opposite of in, in the natural poor. This poor is this, I have a hunger, I have a longing for the Lord. You're blessed because you, God's going to pursue you. All right. So that's so important. And, um, okay, so yeah, we, we spoke about as well in um, the thing about Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, we will not see God. Um, and then I am um, just want to get on to the next points here. So, I did touch on this, and I just want to get to this so we can get on further here. Um, let me just get this one point, which is important. I said to you the following year, in um, 2 Corinthians 6.16. It says, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. So, God is in us, but he wants to reveal himself through us, all right? And um, in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, it says, Because we have these promises, behold, let us cleanse ourselves from all, this is New Testament, by the way, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of 
God. And I say to you this, this does not say um, the blood of Jesus will cleanse us here. And I, I will clarify that again. The moment you and I got saved, what happened? The blood of Jesus cleansed me from sin and unrighteousness. And positionally, I became holy. Okay, we got that. But what we are referring to is the work of sanctification. So in, in, in that it means that it is done inside us and sanctification works out from us. So positionally, when this speaks about this, firstly, it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses me from all sin. All right. But what is important here, what we're referring to when we speak about this, even these scriptures about um, dealing with the flesh and perfecting holiness, uh, we need to understand it is something, it is a work of sanctification. God is working our lives. Because you know what, maybe a year ago I battled with this thing in my area. God gave me a breakthrough in that. Um, and yeah, my hormones are working up, you know, and this, and you know, my friends this, and suddenly. But I need to deal with that sanctification. I deal with that happening in my life. All right, so we have to cooperate with him. In 2 Corinthians 7, 11, it's, uh, 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 1, it says, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and uh, spirit. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8 says, God's will is for you to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin. And then I said to you this thing is that, um, like Hebrews 13, 3 says, the bed, the marriage bed is undefiled, meaning that there's no one else spending it with you, your husband, okay? It is the married. I said the shocking stats to you, and I said, don't let this be an excuse what I share with you. Because sometimes when a leader falls morally or whatever, it's almost an excuse for the body. Oh, well, if he did it, I can do this. Please don't. That's exactly, the Bible says when a shepherd is struck, the sheep scatter. That's exactly what happens. And that's the lie. It is not an excuse for you to go and sin now. So I say to you, this is a shocking thing. And, and I'm, I'm saying this because the church doesn't speak about this openly. And I'm saying 67%, this is statistics, 67% of people in church, the American church, and I say you can sometimes spread it out. We don't know exactly our percentage in South Africa or in Europe, whatever. Some places are going to be higher. But 67% of people in church are watching pornography. And we wonder why the church is not having an impact in the world. We wonder why people are turning and not serving the Lord anymore. We wonder why marriages are breaking up. We wonder why young people are turning to total mess and they're confused. We wonder why our young people are, are confused about identity. Remember from the start we said that when we're pursuing God, we're pursuing holiness, we're putting these other things away. It goes, has to do about our internal world. What are we thinking about? Yes, people have been abused and misused. Yes, people sit with pain. And therefore the excuse is, well, I feel pain, therefore I need to have this. This gives me instant gratification. That's the lie. Because there's always results. Remember, the devil will never give you something or influence you to do something without asking something back. That's how he works. All right. So, um, the good news I said is that whatever bondage or whatever thing you might be sitting with, struggling with, that, that the blood of Jesus is enough to get me free from sin as well as from the bondage of sin. That's what I want to encourage you with. And I, I really believe there's grace that has been released in that for those online, those that are here, because there's something God wants to do. He's looking for a bride. And you're wondering why there's shaking happening in your life and in the world and in things around you. is because Jesus is looking for a bride without blemish, without wrinkle. That the church can reveal the glory of who Jesus is. As we're revealing, looking him face to face, 
that we will manifest that glory in a very special way. So those online don't know this, but I mean, we don't know even, um, I'm just mentioning it, this is a side thought here, that actually our whole floor and that even here in this place this morning, um, we came in here this morning and we don't know if it is, we've seen the glory of God manifest in different ways. We don't know if people worked here previously or something with, with, with um, glitter, but the whole floor has been covered even to our kitchens and whatever with this, whether it's glitter or not, but I just said, well, these are signs that point towards the one. There's a glory that is coming in the church, is what I want to say. That will be revealed through the church. And that, we, that God really is, is, is really stirring that in our hearts. So, just to continue here as well. I, need to, um, I want to just touch on these things here where it says that... So, just remember the, the thing about... Uh, when, when, when there's contamination that comes in our spirit, so even as Christians, contamination can come, or filthiness can come in the spirit. What is that? That contamination comes in the inner person's thoughts, your motives, your intentions. That's how that, that spirit of dirt can influence, of filthiness. And this is what 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 to 10 speaks about, about uh, don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or practice homosexuality or are thieves or are greedy people or drunkards or abuse or cheat people or none, uh, uh, cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom. This is the New Testament. Now, um, in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 it says the following our purpose is to please God not people he alone examines the motive of our hearts I say it again this is a new, in the New Living Translation it's uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 it says our purpose is to please God not people alright tell that to yourself why use what's your motive with friends, people? Um, our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. What is the motive of your heart that drives you? The motives, uh, so remember this, motives are driven by who we desire to please. Just take note of that. Our motives are driven by who we desire to please so whatever your motive is check your motive with people with friends with family parents children business people what is your motive because i'm going to give you three points here every human has three images that drive our motive every human has three images that drive our motives what is our motive the first one is this our perceived image what is perceived image? So our perceived image is the way others see us. Your perceived image is the way others see us. That's the first one. Second one is our projected image. What is our projected image? Oh, I'm tough. <laughs> the way people, the way we want people to see us. Okay? So now... Just, I mean, this is where the woke thing is gone. Like, you don't know if I'm Arthur or Martha. So I want you, I, I'm, it's my projected image is how I want you to see me. Yeah. All right. The third one is my actual image. Yeah. I just need to throw this in just for bonus. The actual image of the devil is he's a little twerp. He's a little weakling. He's a failure. That's who the devil is. The Bible says the day that of judgment we're going to see, is this him that caused this in the nations? Like, is this the we the tweezel, weasel, whatever? Do you understand? That's that projected image. Genesis speaks about the, the Satan being a little snake. Revelation speaks that he's a dragon now. 
And yet sin causes decline. Sin makes you weaker. The devil has become weaker since the beginning. Do you know that? Jesus says the devil now is powerless. Any power he has is what we give him. Guys, yeah, let me not get sidetracked. So there's, there's the images that drive our motives. What drives our motives is first our perceived image. The way that others see us. You know, after, ooh, I'm so self-confident. Yes, I'm so, sorry. I'm so self, I'm this, this. And yet inside I'm... Perceived image. The second one, projected image. The way we want people to see us. The actual image is the, our true image. What God sees and will uh, uh, um, do in us. So this, this thing of our actual image is the way God sees us. So when you look in a mirror, remember part of the renewed mind is, it's not like I'm a disaster. No, I, I love you. I, that's the renewed mind because that's the mind of Christ. That's the way God sees me and you. Yes, I've got an extra 10 pimples here. Oh, sorry. Shouldn't say there's a lot of use here. But you, you understand how oh, my hair, or my, I've got sleep in my eye. God's, they renewed mine. He's, hey, man, you're beautiful. You're made. Because you made in my image. Stop writing yourself off. Well, I don't look as nice as that person. I've, I look like I've eaten a cow or two. Or I've, do, you, do you understand? It's, and we sit with these images. Even the, Never mind our youth, our older people. The one looks like the one caused the famine. So, <laughs> my mom used to say it. <laughs> she says, my, my boy, it looks like you've been in the famine and I've caused it. <laughs> but anyway... All right. I oh, love you, Mom. See you one day again. All right. So perceived image. The perceived image is not always positive. Okay. The perceived image. Remember, we are doing things because of our motive. Our motives. What We have to check our motives. Why we do things. So the perceived image is that is not always positive. So a lot of people perceive Jesus as what? As a drunkard. As a friend of the, of the sinners. So people look at you and you say, ah, oh, you're a failure. You're a failure. Just watch out what you agree with. That's the problem. So the perceived image, many people thought Jesus is a glutton. He's a friend of, of sinners. And God the Father said, Jesus, you my son. You my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So the question is, the question is, is will I project myself? In the way people see me or how God sees me. Will you project yourself in the way people see you or the way God sees you? I'll give you a personal example. I went to many schools. Growing up I went to seven schools in my whole school career. And um, every school I went to, I met the school bully. Because every school has a bully or two. Hello, for those that don't know. And if you're new at a school, you will meet that bully. And so I went through that pain. I went through that heartache. But you know what? The biggest mouths, the biggest bullies are the people with the most fear and problems. This is that perceived image. Everyone must perceive me as, oh, I'm so powerful. And yet they, a mouse inside. All right. So um, I say the question is, will, is, is will, will I project myself in the way people see us or the way God sees us? Now, here's an example of Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament in the book of Acts. We'll have a look at now. And Ananias and Sapphira... Um, do you know what? There was nothing wrong with them because they brought an offering for, uh, uh, for the work of the Lord. They brought an offering. They served Jesus, loved Jesus. They're in the New Testament and they bring an offering for the work of the Lord. This is wonderful. Wonderful. But what was wrong with their motive? This is what I'm getting to. What was wrong with their motive? In Acts chapter 5 verse 1, Acts chapter 5 verse 1 it says, But 
there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. Listen, remember the Bible was always previously, it wasn't in verses. Okay, it's just for those as well listening. The Bible was never originally in verses and chapters. These were letters. Later verses and chapters were put in. Who knows, I mean, where's Candace, where you guys do English, you never start a sentence with, but. So it was actually continuing previously. This is Acts chapter 5 verse 1, so what is the last of chapter 4? We need to look at. So yeah, it says um, in verse uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 30 uh, to 31, I think it is. It says, so basically it's the last chapter of verse 4. Uh, uh, it's the last chapter, f um, sorry, it's the last verse of chapter 4. And it says, we have Barnabas, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it. And brought the money and laid it at the apostle's feet. So if you had land in that area of Cyprus, you were actually wealthy in those days, right? So yes, Barnabas. And Barnabas was bringing his, this offering. And what did the offering... Remember, this is continuous. This is not chapter and verses. This is now continuous. The last verse of chapter 4 and the first verse of chapter 1. It was a continuous letter. What... Barnabas had done here, was bringing an offering. What did it do? It created a response from Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira saw, ooh, this Barnabas, wow. Look at this attention you got. Wow. Everyone was, wow, you know, you sold this expensive land and you gave it for the work of the Lord. Wow. Ananias and Sapphira saw this. Okay. And so what happens is, um, and Ananias and Sapphira had a gift also of giving, by the way, as well as Barnabas. That was a gift they had. Their gift was given generosity. But they also saw that when Barnabas gave, it created attention. So your gift many times creates attention. What you give, like, ooh, yes, I gave this. I gave this for the work of the Lord. Uh, can I tell you how much? Look at how many zeros are here. Did you see? <laughs> so, yeah, they see something they thought, but the attention is coming to Barnabas because it's, it's in the same letter written here. And Ananias wanted to appear that they actually gave all. Their motive. They wanted to appear as if they gave everything of what they had sold. What is that? That is a projected image of themselves. That was a projected image of themselves. And they lay the offering at Peter's feet. And um, that was nothing wrong with the offering, by the way. They gave the money, laid it at the offering. But what was wrong was their motive. It was their motive. So, the motive created everything they said actually to become a lie. What is your motive when you serve the Lord? What is your motive for serving the Lord? Yes, Ananias and Sapphira, what they actually wanted, they wanted people to notice who? Them. It's like I'm the worship leader. <laughs> yes, I got the looks. I got the skinny jeans, the smoke machines. I got, <laughs> I'm pulling your leg. Just don't take me all seriously, please. But do you, you understand? What's my motive? And um, you see, the thing is this this is important. And a nice and Sapphira, they actually derive their satisfaction from their gift. Instead of the relationship with Jesus. You can be satisfied because of your gift and your grace in your life. Instead of satisfied in your relationship with God. Why do you think so many 
people in the ministry become shipwrecked because they compare their church with the other church down the road. You see, sometimes I think, ah, oh, something's wrong with me because that church is so many people, it's got so many nice buildings. And the thing is, the projected image that is going out from there is like, wow, this is projected. Look at these people, it's massive. These people, this church is so successful. In whose eyes? Hello? Well, Hollywood is successful. In whose eyes? Black Rock. Some of you don't know who I'm speaking about. Probably the biggest company in the world. $10.7 trillion value. Successful? In whose eyes? So, the thing was that, that the projected image that, that was actually they wanted to go out there, it, instead, of, instead of realizing, and this is what I want you to understand, my greatest relationship and treasure is with Jesus. It's not with my gift I have, with my talent. So here's Ananias and Sapphira. And um, they're busy drawing, you know, from the satisfaction from their gift instead of their relationship now and with Jesus. And they're projecting something. They're projecting something. Oh, I gave this money. Hey, hey look at me. Doesn't that sound a lot like what's happening in social media? Social media is projecting, many times people are projecting something. Even when I started with Facebook many, many years ago, I, I, for many years I didn't. There's a reason why I never did it, I won't mention it on air. But then I started to mention it to show that, you know, I can make food, I can stand in the pulpit, I can go water skiing, I can visit friends there, I can do in life. So my projection was, this is, I'm doing life. I'm normal just like you. You don't have, I'm not a frozen chosen because I'm in the ministry, because we're all in the ministry. So that was my thing. But social media is dangerous sometimes when we try to project something, especially the young people know what I'm speaking about. What I'm not. That's a projected image of what I want you to think of me. But that's not who I am. Right? So Acts uh, verse 5, 5 says, As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell on the floor and died. This is the New Testament. The testament of grace. Just by the way. <laughs> so, yeah, he drops down dead. And then we know, we read further on. Actually, his wife comes in a little bit later. She wasn't there at the same time. She comes in, same thing, drops down dead. He says, your, your husband's just been pulled out here. Yeah, you go. Boom. New Testament. In Acts 5.11, it says, everyone, listen to me. Acts 5.11 says this, and this is, I'm going to probably preach on probably next week because there's something God is pushing on this thing. But everyone heard about it, what, that what happened here was, verse Acts 5.11, everyone who had heard about this basic was terrified. So the Bible says, great fear came upon the whole church. Let me tell you, friends, great fear is coming upon the whole church. And I will, I will explain to you what that fear is. It's not the fear you think. The fear of God needs to come back to the church. That even in the New Testament, these people who were born again fall down dead. Oh my goodness, don't get confused with theology. This is what happened. That word great is the word we get, mega. The Greek word mega. Mega, which fear basically filled the entire church. And so, listen to me, we have a church that actually loved God. But guess what? They lacked the holy fear of God. Do you know that so much of the church today 
loves God but lacks the fear of God. What puts the fear of God in you? Realizing the glory of God. Remember I spoke about three Sundays ago about even in Revelations about the, 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 the 24 elders and the cherubim and seraphim and how they every 24-7 that's given a time period although there's not time in, in, in heaven. They're not defined by time. They live outside of time. But giving us a reference to time 24-7 they would say holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Because every second God would reveal a new facet of who he is. Holy, holy. Holy, holy. That's why I say we, we, we have the most greatest opportunity to worship God in our battles on earth. We will never ever have that battle again in heaven. We will only have the split second of time to worship him in a way where we have to choose. Even though we don't feel like sometimes. So... Yeah, they realize, they see the glory, the fear of God. Remember, I'm going to say this very clearly. The fear of God is not to be scared of God. Please remember that. The fear of God is not to be scared of God. It's being terrified of being away from Him. The fear of God is not being scared of God. It is a fear of being away from Him. Because the Bible says the fear of God was Jesus' delight. And you know that it is what kept Him strong to go to the cross for you and me. Isaiah 33 verse 6, and you can have a look at Isaiah 11 verse 3, Isaiah 33 verse 6, and Isaiah 3, 11 verse 3. It says there that the fear of the Lord is God's treasure. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is God's treasure. It's a treasure. So the fear of God is Jesus' delight. Do you know what Paul says? Paul says the following. He says, holiness is, ref, uh, re, uh, is perfected, matured in the fear of the Lord. I say again, holiness is perfected and matured in the fear of the Lord. Do you know what the next greatest move of God on planet earth, I said it last week, will be the holy fear of God. Yeah. I said this, the Bible says that the one main description that Jesus is coming back for regarding the church is a holy church without blemish without a sprinkle that's what he's coming back for that's the emphasis the bible gives so this is i want to just encourage you with and we're going to almost land um what makes the church glorious in her holiness guess what we get free from things. I say again, we get free from things when we walk in holiness. Because when we walk in holiness, grace is, is released. Did you hear what I said? If you're battling in areas of your life uh, from just purity in certain things, whatever, they, I really believe this is what the word says, that when we walk in holiness, <laughs> grace is released. So yes, I remember, I'm not speaking about positional uh, holiness, I'm speaking about sanctification. So positional holiness, yet while I was a sinner, Jesus saved me, it's through his goodness and kindness that led me to repentance. That's that coming to know Jesus. Now I've come to know Jesus, but my behavior changes. And this is a sanctification. And because I'm choosing, Lord, I choose not. I choose. Remember in the past you never had a choice. Now that you're born again, 
that that nature, you have a new nature, you can choose life. So there's no temptation that has come past you me that God has not given us the grace to overcome. So we actually have grace when the temptation comes. We have the grace. That's what the word says. So when I pursue that holiness and my behavior in it and my internal world starts changing, my mind's being renewed. Suddenly when, when um, you know, I see that woman, wow, yeah, she's a beautiful woman, wow, wonderful, carry on. That, but that's where it stays. It doesn't affect my internal world. The guy that I see, you see, if you're a woman, you know, oh, why not handsome this or that? But it, it's, that, uh, listen, please, that's religion. Oh, you can't say they're beautiful. Please, beautiful. God made them beautiful. It's fine. But what you do with that is important in your heart. You understand? You still there? All right. So um, the thing is, I'm going to just really crash land this if you're ready for this. So what is the fear of God? And I'm going to next week speak more about this because the church needs to know what the fear of God is. Um, it, it's really something good, positive, yeah. just by the way. <laughs> don't, don't put in your head mindset fear. So I, I'll just give you a touch on this. What is the fear of God? Firstly, it's in the Old and New Testament. It's not just in the Old Testament, the fear of God. Okay? So when we live in the fear of God, we're able to present to God a heart of wisdom. That's what Psalm 110 verse 10 says. Psalm 111, sorry, verse 10. When we live in the fear of God, we are able to present to God a heart of wisdom. So this is the product of living in the fear of God. There's two kinds of fear in the scripture. Two kinds of fear. The fear, um, the fear, the one, uh, uh, remember with the man of, with the talents, the talents. So the fear the one man had concerning talents, he took the one talent, what did he do? He buried that one talent in the ground. He didn't multiply, remember, he had fear. He said he feared and he buried the one talent talent why because he was afraid of his master all right so he was afraid what the master would demand of him so it was listen to this important it was the fear that drove him from the master did you hear what i said this fear drives you away from jesus This, remember, it was a, a parable, the one talent. He, he didn't want to multiply, didn't want to make more money with it. He buried it because he feared the master. Fear drew, pushes you away from Jesus. That's the one fear I'm speaking about. All right? But the real fear of God does what? Draws you to God. The real fear of God draws you to God. It is this endearing fear, this endearing Him. I endear God. I endear Him. It's more than respect, okay? So, this fear is not a fear, listen to me, this fear is not a fear based on punishment. It is a fear based on the value of who He is. So, if being married in that, why would I want to hurt my wife? You want to love them. You, you understand? So, the, this fear is based on value. It's based on value for him. The fear of man, the other fear, it pushes you away from him. So in the fear of God, I'm actually moved by the heart of God. Because it is about how my behavior is going to affect his heart. Do you know our behavior affects God? Am, am I going to disappoint? Am I going to hurt him? Am I going to, so my behavior, I, I change my behavior because I don't, I don't want to disappoint him. I don't want to disappoint him um, because I value what he feels. I value what he feels. Remember the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. 
or don't quench the Holy Spirit. The way I value the Holy Spirit affects how I experience the Holy Spirit. Amen? So, there are people who say that the fear of God is no longer necessary because we are under grace. But, it's still written in the New Testament because Peter talks about it often and strongly. And he speaks about that we need to walk in, in the, the right fear of God because that draws you near to him. Even going into the temple, the, the, the tent of meeting, the different temples, they had to do certain things to actually go. Now, we're not speaking about a lot of rules, but some places they couldn't even walk with their dirty shoes. They had to go barefoot. Just because, you know, this was a shadow of some things to come. You can't take things that are dirty in there. It is a value that you place in Him. Amen. Amen. All right, so next week, I, I'm going to just carry on and I, I want to speak to you next week about really the fear of God because I really believe God wants to cement this in our lives. And, and, and as we, I'm going to pray for you as well now, as well as online, because I believe God wants to release grace. I really believe because when we hear a message like this, it's about grace is released so that we can get breakthroughs that we need because God wants a bride that's pure, without wrinkle. All right, let's stand. Hallelujah. So, Father, um, thank you for those online this morning listening to this message. I pray for everyone here this morning as well that are hearing this message, Lord, about that you've called us to live holy and walk holy and uh, and purely before you and I want to pray Holy Spirit that you would just work in our hearts this morning that things that we have to turn away from that this morning I just want to pray that grace will be released grace will be released to break bondages in Jesus name thank you for your blood Jesus that will break bondages will break, uh, break um, habits that have been formed which are not pure and holy in Jesus' name. And I pray that people will experience not heaviness, but the burden of the Lord, the yoke of the Lord, which is light. I pray that from this day forth, people will see liberation in Jesus' name, breaking free in Jesus' name right now. Even in this place, that people step into a grace just to walk because they value the relationship with Jesus. Lord, and we value that relationship. Holy Spirit, that we don't want to quench that even in our thought life, in our internal world, that we would honor you because we want to know and experience your presence. We want to be closer to you daily. In Jesus' name I pray, Father. May we experience this grace of breakthrough even in this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.